know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at Das Kapital by Karl Marx, originally published in 1867. The key idea of this text is to fully explain the function and flow of capitalism, namely through the purchase of labor power, which uses the means of production to add value to a commodity, through socialized production, which is then appropriated by the capitalist class through capitalist accumulation. On this channel, I've reviewed many classic leftist texts from the Communist Manifesto to the Conquest of Bread. So it only makes sense to tackle Das Kapital, Marx's seminal monumental critique of capitalism. Now, it's been years since I've looked at this text, so let's have a quick refresher. Variable capital is therefore only a particular historical form of appearance of the fund for providing the necessaries of life or the labor fund which the labor requires so for the maintenance the of himself of and which his family, the additional capital, which, number whatever one, be the system of social production, is the result of the purchase of labor and periodical reproduction of the original and accumulation we have seen that even through in the which the capital and the loss of the old capital. Wait, what is that? <laughs> Marx's capital for beginners? Okay. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at Marx's Capital for Beginners by David Smith and Phil Evans, Pantheon Books, 1982. The key idea of this text is written right on the back of the book, where it states, This beginner's guide illustrates Marx's key concepts without losing his humor and the immense vitality of his great work. Awesome, I like that. Well, let's not waste any more time and take a look at this text in depth. To start, we have a how to read this book section, which summarizes every chapter and basically does my job for me. So don't look at this part, um, it will expose my laziness. We then get a brief biography of Marx, which is pretty cool. It discusses the German Revolution, the Communist League, and stuff like that, which is helpful for understanding where Marx's ideas came from. After that, we get into the text proper. Chapter 1. Commodities Starting with the basics, Smith and Evans define commodity as anything produced for exchange. If you make yourself some dog biscuits, not a commodity. But if you take some of those biscuits and sell them at the local farmer's market, boom, commodity. Smith and Evans continue. The unique feature of the product as a commodity, it has two dimensions, both what it is and what it is worth. This is about use value and exchange value. Building on the concept of commodity, Chapter 2, Products for Use. Smith and Evans explain that with the development of capitalism, production moved from focusing on producing for use to producing for exchange. They state, Use value, not exchange value, was the goal and result of pre-capitalist production. Only in capitalist society, thus, does the product lead a double life, as a value and use value. See? See? I, I told you. It was all going to be about use value and exchange value. It's almost like I already read this book. It's almost like I'm reading all of this right from a script. It's almost like I planned out the whole goddamn- Chapter 3, Alienation of Use Value. Smith and Evans explain that, if we are fully to grasp capitalist production, we must recognize, above all, that the double life of the commodity is neither peaceful nor harmonious. On the contrary, value and use value clash. Y'all remember what Radiant Depay said in our review of Society of the Spectacle? Take a used car. You can sell it to get some money. Uh, this is the exchange value. Or you can continue to drive the used car around until it breaks. This is the use value of the car. You only get one or the other. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. Since we live in a society that makes things for trade, exchange value tends to be more dominant. This is how we can have empty homes and homeless people. People could use those homes, but homeless people usually can't provide a good enough exchange value 
for the homeowners to sell their empty houses. Smith and Evans explain this concept in this way. If a commodity should fail to demonstrate exchangeability, its usefulness too will be canceled. Super canceled. It must prove its exchange value before it can be eaten. If no one buys it, the bread will rot on the shelf, even though people starve. The bread will rot on the shelf, even though people starve. This is about one key problem caused by focusing on exchange value. Chapter 4, Overproduction. Smith and Evans explain that if a firm produces too much of a commodity, then the price will fall below the level the firm wishes to get for the commodity. And rather than sell it at a reduced cost to those who need it, the firm will destroy the so-called overproduction. As Smith and Evans state, Business intentionally and cheerfully destroys part of its product. Why? Simply to raise prices and profits. Now, this might sound weird, a company intentionally destroying its own product, but let me tell you a story of this happening in my life. Now, I normally am vague with specifics about places where I've worked, for doxing reasons, but you know what? Fuck Target. Anyway, as I was saying, I once worked for a department store that had recently began selling produce, and the managers stressed that the store needed to leave the best possible first impression on the general public. What this meant was the store literally throwing away every little piece of fruit that showed any signs of ripening. And not donating the fruit or giving it away, no, of course not. In capitalism, you can't exactly justify selling something that you're at the same time giving away. Now, at this time in my life, I was a full-time student, which limited my hours and therefore my budget. And because of this, I frequented the local food bank to make ends meet. At my local food bank, there was always this box of black bananas labeled, Baking Bananas, Take What You Can Use. Now, I'm not much of a baker, but I was short on food and cash, so I would take bunches of these black bananas and I would blend them up with milk for breakfast. Now, back to the department store. As I said, the managers were constantly grabbing up anything showing the slightest sign of ripening and throwing it away. And the very first shipment of produce was brought in all at once, and so all of that fruit ripened all at once. And on one occasion, I saw my manager, with one of these pallet-sized carts that we would use to recycle cardboard, completely full of just barely spotting bananas, which he was throwing directly into the trash compactor, bunches at a time. Again, not donating them, not selling them at a reduced price, not even composting them. Thousands of barely spotting bananas going straight into the garbage, right in front of my face, while I had a bowl of black bananas at home that I'd been eating for breakfast. This is the insanity of overproduction in a capitalist system. Like I often say, my years of working minimum wage jobs have actually taught me a lot more about the failures of capitalism than any reading of theory has. Anyway, let's continue. Chapter 5 exchange value. Smith and Evans begin this discussion on exchange value explaining, consider an exchange of five beds for one house. These products are not alike. Beds and houses have different qualities and different uses. How then can they exchange as equals? Are they really equals? No. The appearance of equality is false. In reality, people simply decide to exchange unequal things. And I suddenly realized that selling fingers is no different than selling hours. You know, you've, you've got more hours than fingers, we hope, and you can't see your hours, but you've only got a finite number. When they're gone, they're gone for good. You know, my fingers are, are like hours, or my hours are like fingers. You know, it, it's silly. Nobody would go, you know, here, Mr. Boss, you can have my pinky for, I don't use it very much, so you can have it for 650. So how do we agree to exchange these unequal things? On what basis do we decide the value of things? Marx, and subsequently Smith and Evans, answer this mystery by arguing that, materially, commodities may be totally dissimilar, but they do have one thing in common. All require human effort for their production and appropriation. 
This is the labor theory of value. This is about chapter six, abstract labor. Smith and Evans start with some definitions. Useful labor is work activities as they really are with unique material qualities embodied in use value. Abstract labor is work activities treated as if they had no distinguishing qualities embodied in value. For example, a minimum wage worker at a call center or a fast food restaurant or a clothing store might do vastly different things, but the value of their work, their abstract labor, is all the same. It's all minimum wage. As Smith and Evans explain it, when tailors and weavers exchange products, for example, they view their work not as it really is, but as work pure and simple, as labor per se. I mean, let's just look at this little illustration. It basically sums it up. This is about the labor theory of value, that labor is what adds value to things. This concept of abstract labor helps explain a silly critique of the labor theory of value that some ding-dongs often use. They'll say, Oh, hey, you think value comes from labor? But what if I spent all day whittling toothpicks by hand? Would that make those toothpicks worth a gazillion dollars? Checkmate, socialist! Well, no, because with industrial automated manufacturing, the abstract labor, the typical amount of labor that it takes to make a toothpick is very low. So no matter how long or difficult a person's toothpick making process is, the market price will defer to what is considered the typical abstract amount of labor that toothpicks contain. Smith and Evans elaborate on this idea. They state, no matter how slowly you work, the commodity you produce contains only the amount of equal labor time that the average producer would expend. You know what this reminds me of? Y'all remember that sketch from Tim and Eric Awesome Show, Great Job, where Tim could make porcelain tigers appear out of thin air? Tiger! Wow. I mean, I've been doing it for the past week now. Every time I think of tiger, it's... I get this crappy little tiger statue yeah, here. Yeah, I mean, I've seen this before. Yeah. You know what, dude? We can make a lot of money on this. If you're making these out of thin air, I mean, there's no overhead. We're going to be rich. Chapter 7. Alienation of Useful Labor Smith and Evans start the chapter by asking, If, as we have said, every commodity contains or embodies abstract labor, where is it to be found? And they use the example of a coat. Abstract labor is not in the pocket or in the sleeve. In fact, no matter how hard you look, the abstract labor it contains will never be found. This is because abstract labor is a social construct. It can't be found in nature, it has no fixed value. Our understanding of how much abstract labor it takes to make a coat or to do any task is socially constructed. Let's say that at your new job today, you restocked 10 aisles of shelves and the normal amount is eight. If you keep that up, your boss might say, Things have been pretty tight around here. We need you to get those 10 shelves done on a six hour shift. Chapter eight, fetishism. This is about, Oh, oh, take that, you bad, bad boy. No, no. This is about how commodities under capitalism are fetishized. They contain mythical powers beyond their use value. According to Karl Marx, commodity fetishism is the process of ascribing mysterious or magical characteristics to an object. And in doing so, the labor that went into creating the object is covered up. So, let's have a drink of Coke. It's getting warm. It's no longer the real Coke, and that's the problem. You know, this passage from sublime to excremental dimension. When it's Coke, properly served, it has a certain attraction. All of a sudden, this can change into shit. Chapter 9, Money. Smith and Evans state, Value exists in three forms, as commodities, money, and capital. Commodities are use values produced for exchange. Money is the universal commodity, equivalent to all others. Capital is money invested to generate more money. 
For more on money and its function in a capitalist economy, I recommend my review of 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism. Chapter 10, The Accumulation of Capital. This is where Marx cracks the code, explaining why the capitalist class and the working class have such different goals in the economy. Class warfare, if you will. This is about commodity, money, commodity, versus money, commodity, money. In other words, a worker uses a commodity, their labor, to get money, their wages, and then they use that money to buy more commodities, food, clothes, and shelter while a capitalist uses money to buy capital, labor power and the means of production, and they use that capital to get more money. Or as Smith and Evans put it, producers sell in order to buy, capitalists buy in order to sell. They continue, money makes money. An initial sum of money, M, gives rise to an expanded sum of money, M1, pronounced M prime. Not simply MCM, but MCM prime is the capitalist cycle, where M prime is greater than M. It is here that we find the origin of surplus value, the difference between M prime and M. They add, this surplus value takes three basic forms, profit, interest, and rent. And Smith and Evans conclude, Capital accumulation is the defining principle of capitalism, the economic goal and process besides which all others pale into insignificance. Chapter 11. Labor Power Labor power is what adds value and allows someone to sell something for more than what they bought it for, from M to M prime, as we just saw. Or as Smith and Evans explain it, Money buying labor power for the generation of surplus value is what capitalism is all about. Only by purchasing labor power can money act as capital, and only in this way can capital be accumulated. Yeah, I mean, that's it folks, that's all you need. If you know everything there is to know about Marxism and you don't understand this, then you just don't get it. But if you don't know anything, but you do know this, then you got it. That, I mean, that's it. It's what it's all about. It's the whole enchilada. Capital accumulation is the defining principle of capitalism. And only by purchasing labor power can money act as capital. And only in this way can capital be accumulated. Labor power is very important, but it gets explained later. First, Smith and Evans discuss the creation of the laborer. Starting with... Chapter 12, Expropriation. Now you may be thinking, wait, if labor power is what adds value, why doesn't the profits from the added value go to the laborer who produced that value? Well, this is about expropriation. And expropriation is about social production and private appropriation, which I discussed in my review of Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. Essentially, with the advent of capitalism, there was this big historical conversion of people owning the means of production and producing for themselves to our modern economy, where workers go to capitalists and use their means of production to produce commodities for the capitalist to profit from, the workers owning nothing but their own labor power. As Smith and Evans put it, take small farmers growing wheat or artisans making hats directly in possession of the needed tools and materials of their trades, these direct producers simply make use of production resources. The resulting production is independent and self-sufficient. But take away the land, the livestock, the energy resources, wrench the tools from the producer's hands, and what is left? An uprooted vagabond whose only possession is labor power. Chapter 13, A History Lesson. Here, Smith and Evans basically explain this history of expropriation. As Marx said in the Manifesto, the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. And this chapter is an explanation of that, looking at the history of oppressive owners controlling the disempowered public, from feudalism to capitalism. Chapter 14, The Making of the Working Class. It's very important to remember that this conversion to a capitalist system wasn't natural or 
just something that happened. It was forced onto the population by expropriation of the peasants' land, by land enclosures, and laws against vagrancy, and things like that. Smith and Evans explain, By methods of ruthless terrorism, the lands of England were converted from community property and small holdings into a set of gigantic private business ventures. Meanwhile, the number of uprooted, propertyless, and rightless ex-peasants swelled beyond measure. We then get a few little examples demonstrating the laws used to punish the vagrancy of the newly landless peasants, pushing them into the workforce. And Smith and Evans conclude, The terroristic methods and harsh laws by which the landless population had initially been introduced to labor discipline became decreasingly necessary as capitalist production stabilized, becoming the normal form of production. Chapter 15 Surplus Value Having explained how laborers were created, Smith and Evans now address how labor power adds value. They argue, The four hours necessary to produce commodities as valuable as the worker's labor power we call, surprise, necessary labor. The extra time spent producing commodities we call surplus labor, meaning that only part of your shift covers the cost of hiring you. The rest of your shift becomes profits because labor power is the only thing that adds value during the production process. Let's say that, heaven forbid, you drive for Uber. The car itself provides no value on its own. It is simply an investment. It provides no labor. But you driving the car provides labor, and that's the part of the process, the driving for Uber, that provides value for the owners of Uber. The basic idea here is the production of a commodity has two parts. One part is what's called fixed capital, i.e. the tools and raw materials that go into producing a commodity. And the other part is what's called variable capital, the labor that adds the value to the commodity. If Marx bought a bunch of paper and turned around and tried to sell it, he would not have added any value and would probably only be able to sell the paper for about what he paid for it. But if Marx takes that paper and writes Das Kapital and compiles it into books, labor power has been added to the paper and it can now be sold for more than what it was purchased for. Likewise, if Smith and Evans simply bought Das Kapital and tried to resell it, they wouldn't likely be able to sell it for much more than what they paid for it. But if they take Das Kapital and use their labor power to create something new, like Marx's Capital for Beginners, they have now created value. And if I take Marx's Capital for Beginners and use my labor power to create a video essay review around its contents, I too am... Well, am I adding value to anything here? I guess I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Do I know? I don't know. Chapter 16, the rate of surplus value. All right, I'm sorry folks, it just can't be helped. Capital is very dense and the math aspects of capital were going to have to creep in here sooner or later. So let's just dive into it. Smith and Evans state, in money commodity, money prime, the basic change is from money to money prime. We can now show this by two new equations. One, capital equals constant capital plus variable capital. And two, capital prime equals constant capital plus variable capital plus surplus value. In layman's terms, if you are working class, you are getting ripped off because the cost of the raw materials plus the private ownership of the means of production plus your labor power minus your so-called surplus value added through socialized production expropriated through private accumulation by the capitalist equals fuck you. Smith and Evans put it this way. First, money bags cuts the time required to produce a watch from 20 hours to 18. Then cash box retaliates by cutting it still further. And so it goes like a tug of war. Now, where have we heard this before? The worker wants to work at the least intensity for the most pay, and the capitalist wants the worker to work as hard as they can for as little pay as possible. The owners want workers to work as hard as possible for as cheap as possible, and the worker's goals are the exact opposite. In capitalism, 
In class warfare, you want to work as leisurely as possible for the most pay, and your boss wants you to work as hard as possible for as little pay as possible. Your boss wants you to work as hard as possible for as little pay as possible, and you want the exact opposite. Chapter 17, Labor Power and Class Struggle. First, Smith and Evans need to clarify something. It is clear that most working people live not at the level of bare subsistence required for simple biological survival, but at the level of subsistence defined socially. What workers need is not determined by nature alone, but by social custom. Smith and Evans continue, The antagonism between capital and labor expresses itself in conflict over just how much workers require. Poor families in the United States are not what they used to be. 99% of them have a refrigerator. The image we have of poor people as starving and living in squalor really is not accurate. Many of them have things. What they lack is the richness of spirit. And Smith and Evans conclude, the capitalist constantly tending to reduce wages to their physical minimum, while working people constantly press in the opposite direction. The worker wants to work at the least intensity for the most pay, and the capitalist wants the worker- No, 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 not twice in one video, okay? I think we get the idea. And finally, chapter 18, Abolition of Wage Labor. This is the what's next solutions portion of the text, and Smith and Evans state, the ability to work does not have to be a commodity with a particular exchange value sold for wages. Rather, living labor power, real working people, may unite for democratic, nationless, sexually equal cooperative production. Production for shared use. This would be communism in the authentic sense of the word. Ordinary working people, democratically in control both of production and the rest of social life, producing for use, not exchange and profit. And Smith and Evans conclude, without capital, without bosses empowered by the possessions of money to buy and control labor power, workers could genuinely be free. It would once again be possible to combine labor power and means of production organically, directly. No sale of either labor power or means of production would transpire. Democracy, between workers rather than the tyranny of capital over workers would become possible. Collective labor power, workers united, would freely associate for cooperative control of the means of production. Now, there's a lot that happened after Das Kapital was first published that needs to be addressed, and the chapter does discuss these things. Trotsky, Lenin, Stalin, Luxembourg, a few other thinkers, and most importantly, the workers. And this is an important elaboration on what has transpired since Das Kapital was originally published. And finally, the text ends with a Marxist dictionary, which covers all kinds of great Marxist and relevant terminology. You got your alienation, your anarchism, your capital, and dialectics, and expropriation, fetishism, labor power, private property, surplus value, use value, and much, much more. Conclusion. This book is just great. Way better than whatever that other shit I was originally gonna review. <laughs> but I jest. N no, there's no substitute for the classic. But Das Kapital really does take some doing to get through, I highly recommend using a companion piece of some sort. Either this book, or the one David Harvey wrote, or something. Really, I think it's quite essential. But how does this book stand on its own? I think it could easily be read just by itself. Maybe you want to read something accessible before deciding if you want to read something by Marx. I mean, this book is under 200 pages, and honestly, with the number of illustrations and bold fonted sections, it's a really quick read. And with the chapter summaries section at the beginning and the dictionary section at the end, it's a very easy book to go back to as a reference source, whether you're reading Marx's work in tandem or if you're simply engaging with Marx's ideas and want something to refer to. It's good for that too. Speaking of reading Marx's work, this book plugs the Grundrisse a lot. Like, five times a lot. Now, I haven't read The Grundrisse myself, so shame on me, I guess, but I will get around to reading it eventually. 
In fact, actually, fun fact, my copy of Das Kapital is just a poorly abridged version of Volume 1 of Capital. I don't even have all three volumes. Fuck me! Turns out I'm a total fraud. Anyway, this seems like as good a time as any to thank my wonderful patrons. You folks are the reason I'm able to add dog insurance to my tight budget. And you also help me with funds for new books and for future reviews and lots of great stuff like that. I really do appreciate it. It helps a lot. And if you would like to have your name added to this wonderful list of supporters, you can go to patreon.com slash radical reviewer. And if you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, then you can get your radical reviews here with the radical reviewer. Thanks for watching. Come again when none of those things are around. I just hope it's before people go extinct.